Uh, we'll have uh, Krupa present the uncontrollable twitches. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Krupa. I'm presenting on behalf of Medicine 2 on the uncontrollable twitches. So we have a 63-year-old female, Mrs. N, who presented to us with generalized muscle spasm for two days and difficulty in swallowing for seven days. The generalized muscle spasm initially started as stiffness and pain over the lower back, which progressed within the two days to the entire body and painful muscle spasm. The difficulty in swallowing, which was there for seven days, started off as difficulty in swallowing solids initially, which progressed to liquids. On examination, her vitals BP at 140, 90. She has tachycardic and tachypnic. CNS examination, she was conscious and she was oriented. She was noted to have frequent spasm, three to four spasms every 10 minutes along with arching of the back. Spasms were provoked by touch, sound and bright light. The motor, sensory and cerebellar functions could not be assessed because of the uncontrollable spasms that were there. Her abdomen, the abdomen was tense. And frequent spasms of the abdominal muscle was noted. Respiratory system, she was tachypneic, rest normal vesicular breath sounds, and CVS was also normal. Um, sorry. Okay, the slido thing is not coming. Any with just the brief history, any differentials that we can think of per se. <coughs> Yeah, some of the investigations, uh, relevant investigations that was that was done. Um, HB was at eight point one. That's a clinical diagnosis. I don't think there is a confirmatory thing. Confirmatory. Um, WBC at around eleven thousand three hundred platelets of two point five lakh. Calcium at eight point five. Phosphorus <laughs> at three point two. Magnesium at three point nine. Sodium one thirty seven. Potassium three point six. Her CPK was at sixteen thousand one hundred and forty five. LFT showed a mild transomnitis. MRI transomnitis, Krupa. Um, the SGOTPT was elevated to around 200. And sure. MRI brain showed no significant abnormality. A CT thorax abdomen pelvis was done, which showed a left rectus sheath hematoma with fracture of bilateral uh, ischiopubic rami. So, as Mom said it's uh, the clinical diagnosis that we made after primarily the history examination was that of tetanus. Uh, just a brief, uh, this on the disease, it was described around 3000 years ago in Egypt. So it's one of the really old disease that we're still dealing with. The organism primarily is Clostridium tetanus. It's a gram-positive rod-shaped bacilli. Uh, the toxin that is released, which is causing all these symptoms is tetanospasmin. Basically, it has a retrograde transmission across the neuron, goes to the neuromuscular junction, inhibits the inhibitory new, uh, inhibitory uh, things like glycine and GABA, and that causes the uncontrolled positive this, which is causing the spasms. So the types of tetanus that is described as generalized tetanus, which we saw in our patient, which is the generalized toniclonic seizures without any, um, between the two episodes of seizure, there is still a tonic spasms. As between the two uh, episodes, there is still, uh, the tone is increased. Localized type of tetanus is where a certain group of muscles. Localized group of, uh, localized type of tetanus is where a group of muscles particularly are involved. Cephalic type of tetanus is where there is an injury to the head and the soft tissue around it, which causes primarily cranial nerve palsies. Neonatal tetanus is postpartum uh, transmission to, through the mother, through uh, unsteral umbilical cord and things. The differentials that were considered during this time is drug-induced dystonias. Primarily, the differentiating factor would be uh, Drug-induced dystonias are reversed by anticholinergics that can be given, and they primarily present with eye movement abnormalities. 
Christmas due to dental infection. This is actually how our patient originally presented seven days ago, but definitely this will not progress into generalized muscle spasm. Stagnin poisoning, um, very similar to tetanus. The only way to differentiate between this is blood levels and blood and urine levels of the drug. Malignant neuroleptic syndrome primarily presents with um, high grade fever and altered mental status, which is again a different tetanus. There's another closely related, this called stiff person syndrome. Stiff person syndrome primarily responds to diazepam, very low doses of diazepam also the stiff person syndrome and it does not present with facial spasms as such. Uh, the management is basically halting the toxin production, wound management, uh, washing with plenty of water if there's an active wound and this antimicrobial therapy. There is a definitive role for giving metronidazole 500 mg IVQ 6 hourly or 8 hourly. And if we are suspecting a mixed infection uh, for bacterial prophylaxis, cephalosporins can be used. Neutralization of the unbound toxin, tetanus immunoglobulins are given. The definitive, this is IM 500, intra, 500 intra, uh, international units. The studies show generally there is no effect of intrathecal immunoglobulins in tetanus. So um, a meta-analysis showed there is no benefit per se. Another one that was produced, uh, another paper that was uh, published in Lancet showed there's no mortality per se associated with giving intrathecal uh, immunoglobulins either. So in our patient, we actually gave both IM and intrathecal. Active immunization. Once a patient has tetanus, does not give him a lifetime immunity against it. So active immunization is recommended. The spasms can be controlled by benzodiazepine and neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, management of the autonomic dysfunction is primarily by magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate has actually shown to have mortality benefits and reduction in the other sedatives that can be used for the spasm and airway management. In our patient particularly, because of uncontrolled spasm, the CPK was highly elevated. Patient had gone into rhabdomyolysis. Three weeks patient was in the ICU. Uh, Two days ago, we could, we, patient was tracheostomized. We could bring the patient back to the ward. We are giving her um, spontaneous breathing, intermittent spontaneous breathing. We are giving her a trial right now. And she's doing better. Thank Can you. you go back to your first slide, uh, Krupa? Yeah. First, the history. Yeah. What else would you like to know there in the history? Because that history no. is really, really wound. If there was a wound infection. There. Why do you think this patient developed tetanus? There was an active wound that was there, but just because we couldn't get the history directly from the patient, we didn't know if whether the spasm caused the wound. What or was the wound? wound? It was, although the medial malleolus, there was an active wound. Or there was a wound. There was a wound. Okay. What other history do you want to know in a patient like this? Because uh, tetanus is a clinical diagnosis. You do not go for, there's no testing that will confirm a diagnosis for you. It's a clinical diagnosis that you make when you see the patient and do the history. So what is the one other important clinical history that you'd want to know in a patient like that? Any of the registrars? What prevents tetanus? Why do we all not get tetanus when we have immunization? Yeah, immunization. Okay, one is the wound, but the second is the immunization. No. Somebody who's 63 year old, you may you may miss out. Why? What is the indication for that CT thorax abdomen? Actually, she was continuously she was able to go the... through it, is it? Yeah. We had sedated her enough to go through it. She was continuously having a drop in HP. So that is why actually the CT thorax abdomen showed an active hematoma. That was a spontaneous one because of the continuous spasm and the bilateral fractures that were there. Sure. Any other? Comments. So the feeling is, is that the hip fractures were, I mean, um, were due to the secondary to the spasm that was developed. How often, how often do you have hip fractures? You may have more, more back and spine, but you don't, I don't hear of uh, hip fractures very often. She actually presented to us very late, actually seven days since the onset of this. And by the time she presented her, she had like multiple episodes. Um, spasms that she had developed and they were really bad so that was the explanation she did have respiratory compromise and so that's we had to tracheostomize her and it's a miracle she survived for those seven days with fractures but not having had a 
because they tend to die of uh, spasm, which is why you do an early trach- uh, tracheostomy. And there are scoring systems to actually say severity. I don't know if you Con- used. They're all clinical scoring system. systems to say, should we do, uh, how quickly should we do a tracheostomy? Is it indicated? Yes. Ramya, what is this? No, I just wanted to say it's a very good clinical diagnosis. <laughs> Because when last year we had a patient with my tetanus, everybody missed it because nobody sees tetanus anymore. But you should keep tetanus in your mind because during COVID vaccination stopped. So that is what unfortunately happened. People have, you know, these old diseases are coming back. So you should keep tetanus in your mind. And your patient came in, <coughs> in a very late stage and very severe. That's why because the spasms you could diagnose, it's a very good diagnosis. And that diagnosis is what literally saved the patient. So, 